Hey, Chair, you are now live on YouTube. Thank you very much. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for attending today's meeting of the Environment and Community Panel. The Democratic Services Officer will now conduct a roll call to check who's present. When she calls out your name, please switch your microphone on and confirm your attendance and then switch it off again. Becky, over to you. Thank you. Councillor Bambridge. Present. Councillor Bauer. Present. Councillor Bubb. Present. Councillor Bullen. I don't think he's in the meeting as yet. Councillor Collop. Present. Councillor Devereux, who is subbing for Councillor Kirk. Present. Councillor Kemp, I don't think he's in the meeting as yet. Councillor Lowe. Present. Councillor Rust, who's subbing for Councillor Squire. Present. Councillor Sampson. Present. Councillor Diwali. Present. Councillor Wilkinson. I think she, she's trying I'm, to get into the I'm meeting. I'm sure she's, she's not quite there. there yet. She's here in spirit at least. And understanding order 34, we have Councillor Blunt. Present. And Councillor Holmes. Present. And we have portfolio holders, Councillor Dark. It, he's there. He is in the meeting, yeah. Yes. Good yeah. afternoon, everyone. Councillor Coons. Present. And Councillor Knuckles. Present. Please, that's everyone, Chair. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Um, right. Can I remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded and streamed live via YouTube? And by attending it, you're giving your permission to be recorded and streamed. Members, please ensure your videos are switched on during the meeting and microphones off until you're invited to address the panel. If you're having connection issues, which I know we do have, um, and you have to turn the camera off, just let us know and we'll work through that one. If you need to get my attention during the meeting or want to ask a question, please use the chat function and I will then invite you to address the panel at the appropriate time. And please don't interrupt other members or officers when they're presenting their reports. When addressing the panel, can you please state your name first so that everybody present know who is speaking? Please speak clearly, concisely and get straight to the point. And if for any reason you have to leave early, let me and the Democratic Services Office know using the chat function. So that's all that bit dealt with. We'll now get on with the meeting proper. Um, we've pretty well been through apologies by virtue of substitutions and all the rest of it. So we go straight to the minutes of the previous meeting. Is the panel happy that they are an accurate record? Silence will mean you agree. If anybody's got any dreadful um, opposition to it, then speak. All looks quiet, all mics off, so that's good. Right, thank you very much. We will sign those one day. Have any panel members got declarations of interest in any of the items? If so, speak now, or if you realize later, speak then. Okay. There is no urgent business that I know of. Um, we have been through the members present understanding order 34. I have had no correspondence, so we can move straight on to Peter Germany, who will present the FENS Biosphere proposal. Thank you. Peter, all yours. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, just bear with me for a moment. I'll just share my screen and I've got a few slides for you. Right, I hope you can all see that now. Um, so just a few slides to introduce the FENS Biosphere proposal. Um, I know you've got the full report on the agenda, 
and that's the report we'll be taking to the cabinet meeting on the 10th of May seeking in principle support for the nomination process for women's biosphere. So first of all, what is a biosphere? Well, it's uh, an internationally recognized, unique and valuable landscape. Uh, that international recognition comes in the form of UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Um, the numbers on the slide here are slightly out of date now and that there are now 714 biospheres across the globe, spanning 129 countries. So a very, very big, broad, worldwide uh, set of designations. What they're about really is um, delivering sustainable socioeconomic development, making environmental improvements, and exchanging knowledge. So just turning to the UK, um, there are currently seven biospheres in the UK. You can see on the map there that they uh, span from the northern part of Scotland, from Wester Ross, all the way down the west coast, down as far as North Devon, and then a couple more along the south coast. Um, there are none at all on the eastern side of the United Kingdom, as you can see. There are none in the east of England, none in East Anglia. If the Fens Biosphere project does get the, uh, the go ahead, it will be the first uh, lowland biosphere in the UK. So you can see again on the slide that back in November 2019, the Fens Biosphere sort of passed the, the first hurdle on the way to uh, gaining this status in terms of being granted candidate status. And that was by a couple of um, UK-based um, committees, which are named there on the bottom of the slide. So just turning to the geography of the area now, uh, this, this gives you a broad idea of the, uh, the, the spread of the uh, proposed designation and uh, just to say that this is all still in draft form. So it spans four counties, uh, Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire and Lincolnshire. Um, you've got the Peterborough Unitary Authority as well coming into the area. Um, largely, as you can see, sort of based on the Cape, Cambridgeshire Fens. So they're, they're the largest sort of Fenland area, if you like. So they, they do dominate the, uh, the designation, but uh, a fair chunk of the, uh, the southwest of our borough as well. Within a biosphere, there are normally expected to be three zones. So these, these consist of the, the core zone. These are sort of designated areas, nature conservation areas, they have existing protection. So these are places like the Ouse Washes, and the Wiccan Fen, which I, I should imagine a lot of you will be familiar with. Surrounding those, those core zones, there is a buffer zone. And in this area, it's uh, about um, really exploring new ways of doing things, really. New crops, techniques can be trialed, creating new spaces for nature, uh, new ways of uh, managing water resources in that area. And then there's a third zone, the transition zone. So this is the, the outer zone, which is where generally most of the, uh, the population of the area would be living around a biosphere. So it's the towns, the cities and the villages in that, uh, that outlying area. And in that, that zone, the idea really is that um, activities that those people need, that those residents need, their housing, jobs and recreation, are made as sustainable as possible, and where possible, they, they will benefit both wildlife and the environment. So this map just shows you where those, uh, those three types of uh, zone are. So the red areas are those um, core zones. So the, uh, the, the areas designated and protected for their 
nature conservation value. You can see the uh, used washers uh, comes into, into our area. Uh, we can fen on there as well and the mean washers and a couple of smaller designations. The buffer zone is the uh, sort of brownie colored area or areas around those uh, designated areas. And we've then got the transition zone, which is the, uh, the yellow sort of mainly outlying area, which is where the, those main settlements fall. So in our patch, you've got Down and Market and you've got the, uh, the villages around the Wisbreach Fringe and uh, the villages sort of running down to the Suffolk border. Got two very large cities in that transition zone, Peterborough and Cambridge. This one just shows you and gives you an idea of which parishes are included within the, the current sort of draft uh, mapping of the area. And again, in, in terms of the, uh, the West Norfolk element of that, um, it runs from the Wisbeach Fringe up in the north through the, through the parishes in that fringe area, running down through Upwell and Outwell and right down to the, uh, the Suffolk boundary in terms of Feltwell, Hotwold and Methwold, effectively to the edge of the Brex in that, uh, that part of the, the borough. There is a steering group that's um, taking forward the proposals and uh, there's, there's quite a wide range of organisations on that steering group from statutory bodies like uh, Historic England, Natural England, the Environment Agency. You've got business representatives. You've got farming and land owning uh, organizations represented on there. You've got academic bodies. You've got uh, nature conservation groups. You've got some community groups. You've got the water management uh, bodies as well. And of course, as, as well as, as all of those uh, organizations, the, uh, the Borough Council is also represented on the steering group. And uh, Philip Heek uh, from the Borough Council is our representative on the steering group. And uh, I believe he's uh, represented at the meeting this afternoon as well. So just turning to the benefits that Fens Biosphere would bring. Well, it is a, a very well-known uh, global uh, international designation, so it gives an area that sort of status people are used to uh, visiting such areas uh, in the days of, of holidays abroad, quite often offends biosphere is quite an attractive uh, and uh, quite a draw to, to a place for, for people to visit. Um, it has the potential to give a boost to the economy as well. It gives marketing and branding opportunities. Uh, you can use the appropriate logos and, uh, and you have that attachment to the, uh, to the international designation. Uh, there are opportunities for agricultural innovation and investment. It's a way of bringing sectors together, whether they be in water resources management, uh, sustainable development or community action. So it can also support social action in the, in the local communities, in the towns and villages, both within and uh, adjoining the, uh, the biosphere. So then turning to the next steps, um, this has been a process that's been ongoing for a little while now. So you can see it sort of started back in 2015 when it was initiated. Um, by the existing partnerships uh, for the Great Fen and the Fens for the Future. Some feasibility uh, works took place um, under funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund back in 2018. And then over the last couple of years, the Fens Biosphere Steering Group was formed and uh, work has taken place to develop up the, uh, the nomination to UNESCO. And that's been funded through the People's Postcode Lottery through their, their um, dream fund. We're, we're really at the point now where the, uh, the nomination is, is on the point of uh, 
being made over the next uh, few months. Um, there's a September overall deadline for that. And if all goes well, and there's, there's, there's quite a bit work, more work to be done by the, uh, the partnership that's leading this, if all goes well, we would be looking perhaps at a, a formal designation in either 2022 or 2023. But one of the key things in driving that really is to get support from uh, some of the key partners. And uh, this is the purpose of taking the report to the cabinet on May the 10th uh, to seek that in principal support. So really, Chairman, that's that's the end of the uh, the slides I'd prepared for you there. And uh, you, you might now want to turn to some questions and some comments and discussion. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I'm sure there will be some questions. Um, I mean, certainly for my own part, I, I think this is one of those occasions where we don't worry too much about getting down to nitty gritty details. Uh, the concept for me looks good. It's a case of how quickly can we say yes, keep going sort of thing. But anyway, I will open this up. I think we have some questions. Um, with a bit of luck, Becky might have the list of who it is in pecking order. Chair, it looks like you've got questions from Council of Western Banbridge so far. Right, okay. Um, we'll go ge uh, geographically, alphabetically. Um, Leslie first, then Joe. It was Joe first, so after you, Joe. Ah, right. Thanks very much, Leslie. I appreciate that. I was going to say we've never gone alphabetically before, but um, <laughs> um, I think it's really exciting. I think it um, supports much of the work that the informal working group um, wants to do, the, the work of portfolio holders, Stuart and um, Paul, and what lots of climate groups want to achieve as well. It looks really exciting, and I personally couldn't think of any reason why we wouldn't want to support it. My question is, um, the biospheres are not protected areas apart from the core and so cannot prohibit any activity. Um, is there any way, uh, we've got a lot of areas in our, in the borough of Kingsland and West Norfolk that we would like to protect. So do we know if in the future we might be able to claim protection for them under this biosphere initiative? Thought that one might come up. There you go, Peter. Thank you. Yeah. Um, obviously, we, we do have a lot of uh, existing protected areas with, within the borough. Um, a lot of nature conservation designations of a a very high level, international level, once again, with the, uh, the Ramsars, the SACs, the SBAs. Um, it's, 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 it's hard to get uh, sort of beyond that level of protection because those are sort of internationally protected by law. We do have existing partnerships for them, for example, in the form of the, the Norfolk Coast Partnership. Um, there was previously a biosphere in the North Norfolk area based around the, the AOMB. So um, that, that is no longer designated in that way. But uh, I suppose you couldn't necessarily rule anything out if there was a, a will and a, a, a wish to sort of come up with that form of protection for, say, somewhere like the, uh, the AOMB. But I suppose it would need to be a balance between... Um, there's the sort of work involved in, in achieving that sort of status and designation and the, the added benefit that that might bring. But certainly, I don't think you would necessarily want to rule it out. OK, thank you. Um, Leslie? Thank you. Um, I was very excited as well about this because um, I'm, um, oh, <laughs> I was brought, brought up just outside Wisbeach, so I know, which of course we all know is the capital of the Fens. Um, so I'm, um, I know the Fens really well. Um, we used to go to Cambridge a lot and go across the various Fens, um, driving that way. Um, the uh, the other thing I thought is very good is um, the science aspect of it for schools because um, most schools are developing their own curriculum now, and um, the schools I'm involved with 
uh, look at local history and local geography. So if we could be something that was, if it could be something that's science-based locally as well, that would be brilliant. But I wanted to know um, about the sustainable housing and the resilience building. I can hardly read my writing. Um, how do we go about that? But before I get the answer, can I just recommend BBC to um, their wild year programmes, they did one on the fens and it's a wonderful watch. So um, I would try and get hold of it and have a look at it if I were you. So how do we go about ensuring sustainable housing and resilience building? Yeah, it's an interesting question really, because uh, that, that is obviously one of the things that the uh, the, the project is, is claiming it would want to to work towards. I, I think it's probably an area where they would want to uh, work through the partnership with, with local communities in identifying ways of, of achieving that within the, uh, the zone. And you, you might do that differently in the, in the transition areas where there is already a greater concentration of population and development to some of the, the areas actually sort of more enclosed within the actual biosphere. I think it is an area where once you're sort of part of the, uh, the, the, the package, the, uh, the, the set of areas, that sort of international sort of network, you, you can then start to learn from other areas, other places that have done things. We've already got places around the UK um, that, would, that would be able to offer examples of uh, how we might do that. And I know those places were drawn upon. There was a conference on this proposal back in January. So some of those, those places sort of came along virtually, of course, but presented what they were doing in, in, in their areas. So there's a, a chance of sort of getting together and learning from each other, really. So, again, it's a bit like you were saying about the sort of education, the, uh, the knowledge sharing, I think. All of that is is quite an important aspect of this uh, this proposal. I think we've um, we should be rightly proud of um, the fens um, for lots of reasons. But do you think we're going to see more thatched roofs? That would be nice. <laughs> I'm I'm being a bit flippant there, but uh, I mean that uh, could be the case, I suppose. Well, and then yeah, it, I mean yes, green beds things, all over the place. Yes, things like green roofs. Th thatch is effectively, I suppose, a, a green roof already, isn't it? From yeah. uh, is very historically, but uh, yeah, why why not? Why not look at, at things like that? Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't think I've got the right order, but I know Michael has a question. As in Michael Dwally, I'm pretty much last on the list, I believe, um, and I'm happy to... to oh, we've to gone off being alphabetical. <laughs> Right, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to defer to others who put their names before me, but uh, I have lots of questions. Um, may I continue, Chair? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, you, Alex? One, one can do nothing but um, commend this project. I think it's a very bold project and I wish it every success. Um, uh, I guess my first question is that... Um, is uh, what is Norfolk's place in this scheme? How can we offer more than just um, a, a, a sort of um, a, a, a verbal support to this project? And is there any interest in uh, silt fen uh, protection and reconstruction? Uh, and may I come back to further questions, please, from that one? Yeah, I think uh, initially what, what the project, what the partnership are looking for is, is that uh, expression of support to uh, help them towards the sort of finishing line in, in terms of actually achieving this, the designation. Um, one of the, the good things, I suppose, is that this, this doesn't actually cost us anything to, uh, to, to be a part of other than the, the officer and member time that's involved in participating in things like steering groups. Um, but yeah, I think what we'll be able to do, we'll develop as, as, the, uh, as the proposal develops. And uh, certainly if it does get as far as, as being a, a fully designated uh, biosphere reserve, I think there'll be much more opportunity then for 
the likes of ourselves and, and hopefully, uh, presumably, Norfolk County Council to get involved in it as well. Um, the other part of your question was about the silk fan, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, again, I, I would think that that would sort of be part and parcel of the sort of uh, work that would develop from this. Um, you know, we, 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 the, the partnership would need to explore ways of, um, you know, developing proposals for different parts of the FEN's biosphere. So I think the silk FEN could, could well come into that. I mean, some of the, the geography is still sort of up for grabs and uh, I think there have been some sort of consultation responses that say more of the Lincolnshire FEN should be involved in the project. So uh, it's still developing, it's still being worked up. There's, there's still time to uh, to influence the uh, the form of it. Okay, thank you. May I? Uh, I was going to suggest, Mike, if you've got a lot of questions, you've you've had two or three. Can you take a back seat for a little while and let one or two of the others in, and then you come back in later? So I, I think now, yeah. okay. You. I think Alex would be next. Thank you, Chair. Yes, and I apologise for being late. I was with the Regional Schools Commission in the meeting over around. So, but my question is, I mean, I commend this, this project, but what we've got in here, we've got the ooze washes, but not the ooze. And I firmly believe, and I would like to say that this should be extended to the ooze for a number of reasons. It's a very important habitat, one of the biggest estuaries in England. But there's the Ramsar site. It's an internationally recognised and protected area, but it also is home to the, the population centres of, 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 of Norfolk. And I think that therefore, capitalising on what we've got and preserving our habitats and species and promoting them, and as Councillor Rust has said, is looking at protecting areas as well, would really be beneficial. For example, the area on the riverside, um, you know, the area, for example, around um, Harding's Way and Harding's Pits, which I asked to be scheduled as a county wildlife site, and I believe that the borough was a, opposed to that, and, and I feel that should be revisited. I think we can do a lot more here, trying to promote what would actually help more people in, in our area as well. And as the, the East seems very poorly served for biospheres, I think the, the whole project would really benefit from being extended to the use as well. So, so could that be commented on, please? And how may we go about including it in, in the biosphere? Thank you. I think that's you, isn't it? Yes. Um, obviously, the, uh, the the designation, the uh, the shape of the designation so far has has come out of work that uh, the partnership has commissioned to make sure that they are defining what constitutes the fens as a as a sort of complete landscape area. So, stretching it further up the river, I, I presume you're sort of talking about the use as far as Kings Lynn in, in your question. That, that might be difficult, I suspect, but there's, there's, there's no reason why we can't feed that comment back into the, uh, into the organisation there. They, they are still looking at the geography. It still is a draft geography, but I, I suspect we may be trying to stretch it a little bit too far in, in, in terms of uh, that, that comment. I don't know, Philip, uh, Philip's on the, uh, the conversation as well, Philip Eakin, that he's on the steering group whether he's got a view on where we might stand with that. Uh, good afternoon, this is uh, Philip, uh, Philip Eek from, uh, from the Tourism Department. Um, absolutely, the, the steering group is meeting tomorrow morning and there is a, an element of discussion on the agenda about going up a little bit further, uh, uh, perhaps along the Great Ooze. Great Ooze. I ha would have to mirror what Peter has said with regards to we might be stretching it a bit to go too further up on the geography. But um, there is at least a couple more parishes that I believe that, that, that there is up for discussion further north than what sort of the one was on the map earlier. Philip, yes, thank you. Because historically, of course, you've got places like Clinch Wharton and, and, and Westwich, which are Fen Edge villages, but also, of course, the sea once covered part of Clinch Wharton. And, and um, you know, when King John lost his treasure in the wash, it was mm. a much wider river. And so historically, I think we'd be very justified in extending the biosphere right up to King's Lynn. So mm. thank you for, for, for saying you'll look into that, because I think this project would be immeasurably enriched if you bring it right up to the heart of the borough. 
Yeah, I suppose there is an argument for saying if you go up the the west coast of the river, it's Fenland all the way, isn't it? It's only on the east side of the river that yeah you kind of lose Fenland a bit. But um, I think there's, there's an argument in there. But Philip's on the case, so I'm sure he will do his best tomorrow. Which is thank you. Um, absolutely right, Chair. Uh, right. Um, I've got Elizabeth, but again, I'm sure there's somebody else. Oh, Ian was in. Yes, that's right. Ian. Andy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to add a little bit to uh, Councillor Bambridge's question about resilience, um, and just to put a bit of context around all of this, uh, I, I'm involved with my Environment Agency appointment in some programmes, one of which is the future of the Fens, as well as the development of the national FCRM flood strategy. And there's a lot of uh, coherence and interaction between the biosphere and the future of the Fens. And the comment I wanted to make is, I find it very encouraging that nationally, all of these features are coming together in a broad scope of projects, which are coordinated, looking at the entirety of the ecological, environmental, social, economic things but for a large tract of this area. One of the challenges is defining the, the, the limits of that area. And at the moment, I have great problems getting Lincolnshire involved, but I think we are making some progress in all of that. But the one comment I would make is that nationally, in terms of the national strategy for flooding and coastal erosion, there is a national measure on resilience in the fens. And what that means, that's going to be looked at regularly by central government to say, how well are we doing within the fens of protecting all of our environment, both ecologically, environmentally, flooding and erosion. And that's a major achievement. And similarly, the future of the fens is also, is the only area specifically mentioned within the national policy. So I think I can give you some comfort in that uh, there is a lot of attention paid to this whole area and the future of the FENS report, looking at the FENS for the next 100 years, should be published uh, mid to late May, which will provide a lot of data on the, on the ecology, environmental factors and other things, which I'm sure the ENC will want to look at in due course. So there's a lot of supporting activity going on. I've no doubt that boundaries of consideration will also extend as, as time goes on. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, Elizabeth, I think, was next, then Andy Bull and then Tony Bob. Well, um, thank you, Chair. As I'm a Cabinet member, I, I would um, prefer to see um, the uh, uh, members speak first. I believe Andy Bullen put his name down before myself. So, he, may, um, he may well have done. I'm not very good at yeah. picking up who comes first on this oh, one. Okay. Okay, um, carry Andy. on, Elizabeth. Carry on, please. While you're on, oh, please. okay, please do. okay, thank you. Um, I, I um, I'm like Councillor Bambridge, I was all, also very pleased to see this when um, I, I actually attended the Fens Biosphere Conference. Um, because I was actually born in the Fens, I was in the floods of the 53 in the flood in the Fens, so and I've always been a person who's quite felt quite proud of the Fens and always felt they should be promoted more because, um, well, when I went on holiday to the lakes once, one of the ladies said to me on the, in the accommodation, she's always loved the Fens because you can see for miles, you have beautiful skies, it's flat to cycle and to walk and lots of open spaces. So I was really pleased when, when I heard about this biosphere, but for the um, Borough Council and, and um, Councillor Russ mentioned two cabinet members. I'm also involved in this because of tourism. And especially at the moment when we're all wanting open space, want to walk in fresh air and, and the fens are perfect for this. And so therefore having a fens biosphere and supporting this, I believe it will also help to um, those who live there feel more proud and have pride of place of the fens. I mean, a lot of our food actually come from the fens, grown in the fens. So I think it's an important place for education, 
the schools, for youngsters to um, attend farms, for, um, to learn science, growing of plants. And of course, we're down a market in this bar fair with the um, line from the London. It will encourage visitors to actually um, visit and bring their bikes and walk, which in the end helps small businesses to, to operate, encourage small, other small businesses, perhaps farm, have, have um, coffee shops, tea shops for visitors. So it's not only for people who are living there or just for the environment, it's for people to enjoy the free open space. So I, I fully support this. And, and um, the reason Philip is there is because it will encourage more people to come and visit. Therefore, those who already live there will fit, have the sense of pride of where they live. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Elizabeth. Andy, back to you then. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, apologies for my late arrival, by the way, technical issue. Um, a statement, really. Um, I originally thought the biosphere was uh, about the environment, but uh, obviously there's a very strong community element. Uh, I've always thought that uh, rural social issues can be often more challenging than urban uh, social issues due to isolation and access to services. And I, I hope that there's a very strong element uh, of engagement with residents uh, and, and is central to the activity of policy as it can be very frustrating when a remote body makes decisions affecting people's lives. So, you know, the people living on the Fen need to know where this is leading and um, I hope that's important. Um, one other little uh, wildlife um, comment I might, might make is uh, I hope that wildlife is at the core of policy as uh, avoiding the risks of safari park type developments with the introduction of non-native species because I think that is big business getting involved may um, have a detrimental effect on local wildlife. And I just one question really, whether extending the likes of Wickham Fen and similar areas is on the cards uh, because they're under threat. And I just wonder whether there's any possibility of extending them. Thank you very much. I think get the National Trust in and ask them what they're thinking of doing. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there's any real answer to that one, Andy. I think it's, it's noted and I'm sure that the points will be taken on by those who are attending the, <coughs> the next um, meetings. Um, but it, uh, it's, there's some good points in there. I quite like those, I must admit. Thank you. Um, we move on, I think, to Tony now and then Alan. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, a splendid idea. Um, yes, it should be extended north to anything which can really be described as a fen, um, because they're all interlinked, just because the soil changes a bit as you go north, um, shouldn't make any odds. But having been brought up in the sort of age we are now, I'm inclined to say, what's the catch? What are people going to find that they can't do once you gone in there that they're going to have a stick to beat us with um is it all a very good idea or is there a downside anywhere hmm. right peter you're first in the firing line <laughs> thank you chairman <laughs> um yeah i mean it doesn't really sort of um impact uh on any of our planning powers for example it's it's not uh not like an area of outstanding natural beauty where it's a statutory designation. So the partnership, I think, has been very firm in saying they, they have no intentions of sort of taking away any of those, those powers in intervening in sort of local um, control processes, if you like, that would still be down to us. So there is no intention to intervene in, in that sort of way. I don't think there needs to be really, because it's a much wider as uh, Councillor Bullen was saying about the about social issues, about economic issues, obviously about environmental issues. So it, it sounds as though, um, <clears throat> Tony, you don't need to worry too much. It, most of it's good and we're in control of that. And the bad bits are the same bad bits as we've got now sort of thing. So uh, yeah, that, that sounds good. Um, I've got Alan next and then Paul. Uh, did you want to speak? Paul Coons. Right, you're after Alan then. Uh, yes, I mean, I've got a few observations to make mainly. Um, I'd like to join with everybody else who thinks it's a, it's a really, really good 
uh, development. And I think it's uh, it's important for us to all recognise that the uh, not us here, but um, the community at large, that that the Fens are a, a particularly special and vulnerable part of the countryside. Um, I think the the other benefit of joining into this international um, sector is that you can then actually look elsewhere for experience. Um, I have no idea where other ones are, are, are situated in a similar space, but if you think about places like the Netherlands, the Camargue in France, similar places which share you know, our type of, of, of landscape and development, um, what they may have been doing um, could be useful for us to, to gain some knowledge from. So I think there's some, some really good stuff there. Um, I think my main question is, is how are we going to publicize this? Um, and I don't really need a, a, a specific answer, but I think it does. we do need to really have a very strong public awareness strategy. Um, and I like the idea of linking it into to education and uh, young people. Um, many people from outside the area will benefit from, from the ability to get in and look and understand the, the, the biosphere in general. I think, you know, that sort of strategy needs to be developed at an early stage and to be very robust. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, Paul, I think. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, yes, obviously, um, as portfolio holder, I'm uh, very keen on this idea. I think it's a, it's a fantastic uh, project, and uh, I hope we manage to get um, the UNESCO status um, thoroughly behind it. My only slight reservation would be on um, agriculture. This is one of the most important agricultural areas probably in the country. It's the largest area, I think, of arable land uh, anywhere in the country. Very flat, very highly productive, all class one arable land. And I'd be very worried if people want to start flooding areas of arable land and, uh, and losing, you know, vast acreages. It's something I don't think we can afford to do. Uh, when they talk about new agricultural methods and crops the only ones i've seen so far have been reeds and flax and things like that which at the end of the day you can't eat so i'd be a little bit um, worried about that side of things and i think we have to keep an eye on that um i'd also just like to say well done to alex kemp for managing to get a, a uh, mention of harding's way into a discussion about fence biosphere well done alex <laughs> Right, um, Richard. Well, being a Fen boy or a Fen tiger, if you want to say, I've lived and born and bred in the Fens, um, allegedly have web feet, um, but I'm very supportive of this. Um, one of the things that concerns me, Peter, is the fact I didn't notice that all the authorities actually have signed up to it. Have you got any idea what's happening there? Yeah, that's, that still seems to be an ongoing process, Richard. It's been going around um, one or two of the, uh, the Cambridgeshire authorities in the last couple of months or so. I've seen East Cams uh, considering it. I've seen South Cams. I've seen Cambridgeshire County Council. I think a couple of those sort of uh, had still had some outstanding questions before uh, they agreed to support uh, the principal in the way that we're sort of suggesting we might support the principal. Um, you're right, I've not seen that sort of every council across the, uh, the sort of spread of the area has, uh, has looked at it as yet and considered whether or not they support it. Again, I don't know whether, whether Philip's got any more information on that from his uh, steering group knowledge. Hey, uh, yeah, Philip from Tourism again. Um, uh, the update that I have is that this past quarter there has been some good progress made with other local authorities, and so the slides might uh, uh, need to be updated uh, after tomorrow's meeting. Uh, I'll be interested to hear how they're getting on. You've broken up, Philip. So, 
somebody's hey, trying to play a guitar. Between everyone. Yeah, you've, you've gone. Oh, I'm sorry. That bad connection here. But um, yeah. Uh, my apologies. I, I think the message to take away, Philip, is that it would be nice if you could winkle out a bit more information tomorrow and perhaps report back. And if, if there's something along those lines, uh, Becky, we could probably put a little update in the minutes, because I don't suppose for a moment you'll have a chance to do the minutes tonight. Um, so we could perhaps just incorporate the, those one or two answers into today's minutes. So that would be good. But you, you've got the picture, Philip, so we'll, uh, we'll wait to hear from you. That's good. Thank you. Um, apart from Michael, is there anybody else waiting to speak? No. Right. Michael, have you got a couple of new questions? I do. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I would just like to, to respond to Councillor Kuhn's um, comment on agriculture. We will need research and development into agriculture on peat fen if we want to make it sustainable. It is rapidly disappearing. And when we hit clay subsoil, it will be good for nothing. Um, going on to that, um, there, there were questions um, about uh, the, um, the, 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 the um, uh, in, in improving or increasing, recreating uh, Fenland. And uh, I, I guess that if, what is, the question I think is, what is UNESCO's interest? Are they interested in the uh, original core Fenland or are they equally interested in um, recreated Fenland? And uh, uh, will there be work, uh, you know, what, what will be envisaged uh, to, 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 if, if, if there is um, a, a view to recreating significant tracts of Fenland, how will we overcome the challenges of impounding and reflooding the land? Um, that was one of my key questions that came out of this. And also um, in, in terms of uh, the, uh, our climate change and biodiversity strategies, there, there seems to be um, a certain amount of common interest with Fenland and South Holland um, on, with, with respect to the Fenland. And I also note that there is a new report out today by um, Natural England on carbon storage and sequestration by habitat, um, which to me is very much um, a value of uh, our Fenland. Uh, and uh, is there likely to be a financial value put on its, um, its ability to provide carbon sequestration, which may overcome some of the, uh, the problems and issues that we have? Thank you. Peter, I think that's probably as much. Um, thank you, Michael. We note those and they'll be in the discussions rather than immediate answers. Would I be right? Yes, I think you would, Chairman. There probably isn't an immediate answer to most of that. I certainly know that in the uh, the, uh, the the areas around the uh, the core zones, the buffer zone, there are ideas around having or creating new areas for nature and sort of new ways of water management. So potentially the the creation of, of new new nature conservation areas and such like there that. Uh, the councillor is suggesting could could come through certainly that sort of mechanism I would think um, it probably is worth looking at things we can do jointly with South Holland and Fenland in terms of uh, what the councillor said about carbon sequestration um, mm. yeah certainly I think once once you're into this sort of partnership those those sorts of things you would expect to flow from the from the process really but as you say it's still in early days, these these uh, proposals will will develop over the next uh, year or two, and I think we'll, we'll probably see more information coming through on that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, I think it, it was Ian who mentioned right at the beginning um, balance, and I think this is um, picks up Paul Coons's point. There's a balance between improving the countryside in its widest sense, and keeping food on the plates. Um, and for the time being, um, 
it's a, it's a it's a delicate balance. But I think one of the the joys of this one is that we're in at the beginning of all this. We have a reasonable chance of of having a fairly loud voice in the whole thing. So the concerns that we've had today, um, and I think they're all quite valid, um, we can we can get our balance and then fight the corner when we have to in the in the bigger one. So um, I, I think we're, we're we're all pretty much on top of this one for the, the good points and the possible downside ones as well. So we'll pull that one to an end then. And as I am instructed here, the recommendation is that the Borough Council expresses in principle support for the designation by UNESCO of a FENS biosphere. And I think from what we've heard, we're pretty well 100% behind the idea. So um, unless anybody suddenly has a, an objection to it, uh, we will recommend that recommendation to Cabinet. Thank you all for the, the input on it. Um, and those of you outside the panel um, on the on the officer side, you've got a pretty good steer for the uh, the next round of discussions, I think. So um, that's that's good. That's that's been a interesting and a, a good discussion. We now will move on to the work program and forward decision list. Um, we are pretty full on the. Um, work program and we're still working under uh, COVID restrictions so I'm not going to ask for any new ideas this time round. Um, we've got enough in the pot to keep us going for a fair time. Um, so I, we'll move on quickly to the next one um, which is it's very short but I think it's quite interesting. It's asking us if we want arrangements for cabinet members' questions to be put at panel meetings. If we do, do we put a standing item on the agenda for this? Do we rotate and ask for a different portfolio holder to attend each time? We put a time limit on each bit of that at, say, 20 minutes. Um, We've got a short time to discuss this one, but my feeling on the middle one, do we rotate and ask a different portfolio holder to attend each time? We're blessed with quite a few attending all our meetings. So whether we put them into a pecking order and say in July it's one and August it's another, et cetera, um, I'm not sure. We could, we could try. Um, got to see how many want to turn up at the future meetings. So I'll go back to the first one. Do we put a standing order on the agenda to have one or more portfolio holders come to our meetings where they can be asked the same sort of questions as they would be asked at a full council meeting? Michael has got a comment he wishes to make. Uh, yes, it wasn't particularly on this first uh, first question, but um, I think that's a very what you have proposed seems a very sensible way forward. Um, for, from, from my perspective on the second part, if I may speak on that, please, is that um, that uh, it, what is most important to us is the cabinet uh, uh, portfolio holders that are pertinent to um, to uh, to. <laughs> environment and uh, community. Um, yeah. So uh, as long as we have access to those um, cabinet members um, and it's not, not restricted, I'm very keen for that to go ahead. Okay, thank you. Anybody else got a different idea? Tony? Name obviously hasn't popped up. Um, surely this is somewhat driven by the agenda. There's no point in having um, the cabinet member for climate change if we're discussing housing or something it's got to be a relevant cabinet member to the agenda okay great if the others turn up too but it's got to be the key member relative to the agenda surely yeah fair point so they would be a definite and the other 
portfolio holders who are, as, as Michael said, pertinent to E and C, we don't often miss them anyway. They usually turn up. So uh, I, be, because we're used to seeing them, I think we're part way through the decision on this one. We have our cabinet members. They're usually pretty accessible. Um, we could perhaps designate each meeting to be, as you say, a particular member for one of the items, but we might, uh, we might be able to deal with all of them at a particular meeting and, and grill them all. Um, I wouldn't want to put them off coming. Um, so I, I think where, where, I'm, where we're ending up on this is that we're quite happy for the concept of having our cabinet members available for questioning at our meetings. I think that, that seems to be really where we're, we're going. Um, so if we're happy with that one, I'll feed this one back into the overall planning of how things are done um, with the uh, perhaps the gentle warning to our cabinet members that um, if they turn up at our meetings, they'd better be ready with some uh, answers known and unknown, because we have no idea what the questions might be. Uh, but I think in principle, it's a good idea, because apart from anything else, it's our questions that get to them, whereas at a full council meeting, we might be overtaken by others who've got questions that we're not so bothered about. So uh, if we've got our, our own pet question time, then I think that's, that's good progress. Okay. Uh, nobody else, I think, was going to say anything there, so don't see anyone. Um, so we, we move swiftly to the date of the next meeting, which is scheduled for the 9th of June. Excuse um, me, Chair. Sorry. It's, it's, it's Councillor Collop here. I did ask to ask a question. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see that come up. That's all right, I, don't worry. Um, before we finish the meeting, I'm going back a long while now, but we had a subgroup with markets. Now, I think it was in the last administration. Um, there was a lot of um, decisions made, one being that uh, the, the roofs of the stalls would all be the same so that we had a nice street scene. And this has never happened. And I'm just wondering how we can take this forward to make it happen, please. Mm, interesting one. Um, from experience, just some years ago with Down and Market, market um, it's a lot easier when you have the stalls grouped together. Times changed in King's Lynn, and for various reasons, the market got spread out over most of the pedestrianised area. That would then be quite difficult to uh, police, shall we say. But um, we, I think we could perhaps put that one into the mix coming up fairly soon. Um, well, I understand, Chair, it's, it's now back at the Tuesday marketplace because they're not allowed to have them down the down the street like Broad Street and that they are oh, back that at actually they are back at the Tuesday marketplace. Right. Oh, well, that does make the issue a lot easier. In, in Chair, would you like would you like me to comment on that? I'm sure. Yes, please, Martin. Um, Councillor Cobb is quite right. There was a, a lot of discussion has taken place over the years in terms of the the scene of the market. And uh, I have to say, I have uh, 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 an absolute agreement that in the ideal scenario, you'd be in a situation where you had um, all of the same stalls to all the same designs, very similar to what you would see if you were having a, a continental market. Regrettably, it's not as easy as that. And certainly on the Tuesday market today, we've had a bric-a-brac stall that hasn't bought any canopy at all. We've, we've had the watch repair stall, which is an enclosed vehicle trailer. We've had the fish stall, which is a tow, tow trailer. And we've had two other stalls, which are have canopies of green and white stripes. 
So it, it is a, it is practically far more difficult to dictate to market traders who, let's face it, have had a very difficult time of late, how they might present their stalls. At the moment, I have to say, at an operational level, I'm just grateful that they're coming to the market, and I'm really pleased to see them supporting the Kingsland market after such a, a difficult period of trading that they've had. So I, I, I might perhaps suggest to you that that now may not be the time for that for operational reasons. Thank you, Chair. I think that's a fair comment, which allows us to put it on the list, Sandra, um, knowing full well that it won't be the next one or two items to be considered. Um, the, only, the only thing, Chair, I, I feel that obviously this was in place long before the pandemic even started, but not that it hasn't been bad, but a lot of the issues are being um, raised around the pandemic at the moment. And when this was done, this must be three, if not four years ago, I wasn't on this market task group, but there definitely was one from this particular panel. And it should have been done a long while before the pandemic, but they're obviously using or Martin seems as though he's using that excuse because of it, you know. If I may, Chair, just for clarification, that is not at all the situation. I, I think um, my, my caution to members is that I, I, I would urge members not to do anything that would make the trading of individual traders more complicated at the current time and perhaps, perhaps suggest to you if it's something that you wanted to visit. And I, I did in the very opening statement agree with you that it would be much better to see a, 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 a much more uniform offering. I do agree that. I just don't think now is perhaps the time to pursue that. But ultimately, that's perhaps a, a, a situation for yourselves to consider. Yeah, well, I think... Um... I've got Tony and Leslie, but in sort of answering that one, I would suggest that if we put it on the list, we've got a pretty big list. It won't be, the, dare I say, the most important item on that list. So I would guess it would be probably the best part of a year before we get round to seriously looking at it again, which would give, hopefully, all the traders that 12 months or so to re-establish themselves and the concept of a market. So there's just a comment from Tony, Leslie and Alex. I was on that uh, committee chair and um, yes, we wanted to see the blue and gold um, stall coverings. Uh, we asked for a market, Toby, that never happened. But two of the easy things that they could do and haven't done was to have the base address of the stall holder so that you could, if there was a problem, you've got something definite to go back to. And the other thing was there was a time before which they could not leave the market so that the public had the assurance that the market was going to be there until a certain time and not go there and find half the stalls have cleared off. Two simple things that could be done at any time. Okay, noted. Yeah. Um, Leslie? Well, I agree with everything that uh, Tony has just said. We spent a lot of time on the markets. We looked at Hunstanton and Downer Market as well. We interviewed stallholders. We interviewed um, other people uh, within uh, the town centre, you know, businesses. So it was just totally ignored, which um, is, uh, you know, a shame. But I think it does need to, we've, we've asked for it to be on the agenda in the past. I mean, I'm talking a couple of years ago. And it was just laughed off, not by the chairman, but by a, a member of staff who is no longer um, a member of staff. So I do think we must have it back, um, if only just or for um, other members to be made aware of what our findings were, because uh, you know, it just makes a mockery of having a task group. So please, can we have it in due course? Yeah, OK. Um, Elizabeth. We'll, if you come in after Alex. Th th thank you, Chair. Yes, I would like to comment on the item on the agenda, anti-littering, and ask if that might be extended to the prevention of fly tipping, because I think that generally there are some issues which we could look at. For example... Yeah, uh, Alex... No, yes. it was talking specifically market at the moment. Oh, right, because I was coming in on the, the, the forward decision list, Yeah, I, I accept that, but we, we, it's market at the moment. 
Thank you. May I come back on the other one later? Uh, Thank yes. you. Yeah. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, then Paul. Thank you. Um, I just want to make members aware that um, the Business Improvement District are now starting again their monthly markets on a Saturday on the Saturday Marketplace, which happened monthly before COVID. And um, they use uniform looking stalls. Now, whether it belongs to the bid or whether they, the stalls belong to the Borough Council, I'm not quite sure, but it is quite uniformed. And there is one on the 8th of May. So if members wanted to visit that market and it does, it does advertise a, a time, I believe it says from nine till two or something like that. It, that, that is quite well organized, usually full on the Sassy marketplace. And as I say, more uniformed. So um, that's quite a good example of, of a local market in Kings Lynn. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, you know, I'm absolutely behind um, Sandra Collab on this. Uh, th this um, survey, I think, was was done before my time in the council, even. So it's probably five or six years ago, and um, it uh, it seems to have been just sort of brushed under the carpet. I've asked a lot of questions about it, and um, I, I, a lot of people, the public, really do want to see the market back and thriving again. And, and I'd be absolutely behind getting this back on the agenda. I have to say, Martin is right. Now is not the time to do it, not for the next, you know, at least four or five months. But uh, I'd like to see it back on the agenda fairly soon, and let's see if we can't get something done about it. Thank you. Noted. Right, Alex, you've got a new point for the list. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, well, it's about adding the prevention of fly tipping, which has become a great issue in this borough and is, is keenly felt by residents who are seeing lots of fly tipping in areas where there shouldn't be anything like that at all. And whether we look at issues such as um, maybe introducing a free first three bulky item collection service and asking the county council to abolish the, the recycling charge at the tip. There's a huge consensus in the borough against that because people feel it's unfair and they feel it's leading to fly tipping. And also about bringing the pest control service back. So if we could extend our anti-littering item to the general prevention of fly tipping, I think this would do the borough a great service. I think there's a fair amount of support for that. The one bit that I would disagree with is that the pest control uh, aspect, um, there are a lot of ex-council pest controllers who are running their own businesses now. Um, I think to, to, to try and introduce a council controlled pest control service would be duplicating effort when we haven't got the resources to duplicate that sort of effort. But the rest of it, yes, I think that is something that we could definitely put on the agenda. If we get the solution to preventing fly tipping, then we will solve all our financial problems because we're able to sell the ideas to all and sundry. Um, but it, it, it is becoming a, a bigger problem, there's no doubt about it. So we'll, we'll put that one on um without doubt um, chair can i just say when the climate change working group asked me to speak to stuart at length about these problems which i did a, a week or so back i had a three quarters of an hour phone call with him on these matters he's fully aware of them and he's very much on our side even more than what we've been asking for right so that will eventually get its way back into the panel mm. Yeah, that's if, fine. So, yeah. If, if, if I if I can speak, chair, I might be able to assist. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And and obviously, it's down for you as a panel to decide what's on your forward agenda. But as the cabinet holder at full count, the last full council in the paper, members will have seen that I've instructed a review of our policy, which is now somewhat in the tooth as uh, long in the tooth as some of these things go regarding our response to litter, uh, litter um, and also uh, fly tipping and also illegal burning, et cetera, et cetera. And that will be coming forward as a review paper to Cabinet. And there will be an opportunity, obviously, if, if you felt it um, uh, something that your members wanted to actually have it brought before you so that you could comment on it before that stage. 
I think we would be very happy to have that come to us. Um, the suggestions look as though they're taking care of themselves, folks. We're, um, we're getting everything. It comes up the list fairly high. Um, so that, that's good. Um, we've perhaps changed the, uh, changed the listing a little bit. So um, all the points made today have, um, have worked. Uh, so that's, that's good. Um, that then I think does take us round to the next bit, which is our next scheduled meeting is the 9th of June, but uh, with the way everything uh, seems to get extended or foreshortened, um, it could be a case of watch this space, but let's work on that one. Um, now my, my next question is, is Becky, uh, are we going ahead with the next item? Yes, we are, Chair. Right. In that case, it's big breath. And we have to now consider passing the following resolution. That under section 100 bracket A bracket bracket 4 bracket of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting for the following item of business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph three of part one of schedule 12A to the act. Panel, do we agree that we bring this into force? Right, okay, Becky, can you now exclude the press and public please? <laughs> 